It's usually told as a story of courage and betrayal. Although, actually, it's about a clash of egos and how this destroys lives. Either way, though, this is the story of Fourit Latour. It is a story of two men and one woman. No, 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 not this sort of story. It's a very clean story in a North American sort of way. Nobody smokes, drinks or makes love on screen. People die, but that's okay somehow. So, here is our first man, Charles de Saint-Étienne de la Tour, known simply as de la Tour. La Tour arrived here in the abandoned settlement of Port Royal in 1610 at the age of 17 and a member of only the second French expedition to this area. It was a wilderness. La Tour and his companions, who included his father, endured untold hardships, hunger, cold, insects. But fast forward 15 years and a measure of success has been achieved. It wasn't the intended flourishing farming colony. No, they didn't have the men or more importantly woman power for this. But Latour, now in his 30s, married to a local woman and as the heir to his best friend, the acting head of the whole Acadian enterprise managed to get going a nice trade in furs. He had four or five posts now, but he wasn't out of the woods yet. In 1627, no, make the 1626, the dwindling numbers of his companions forced him to write to France for help. His father took the letter. The French king, Louis XIII, wasn't much interested in this new faraway colony. Well, the work of government was not his favorite pastime. But his first minister, the Cardinal Richelieu, very much was. He set up a company called the Company of New France or the Company of 100 Associates. And soon enough, Latour's father was heading back on board of one of the four ships laden with supplies, tools, equipment, weapons and fresh delivery of Frenchmen. What could go wrong? Well, when almost there, so near yet so far, they run into English pirates, I'm um, sorry, English privateers, licensed pirates, the Kirk brothers, who were actually Scottish, shipping some Scottish colonists to what they considered Nova Scotia. Next thing you know, the Kirk brothers, using the supplies, tools, equipment and weapons provided so kindly by Richelieu and taken with those four ships to capture all new French forts, including the settlement at Quebec, and hold them for the King of England. All forts, I said? Well, no, all but one. Latour the Younger held his headquarters at Cap de Sable against the prevailing English forces and his own father, who crossed over to the English as their prisoner and came to tell him to do likewise. Well, all the while he must have been thinking, whatever next? Well, what happened next was that King Charles I of England, who hadn't yet lost his head but has lost a great deal of money, decided that if cuts had to be made, well then the new acquisition north of New England was the place to make them. Soon he had an even better idea. Why not sell the thing back to the French? Richelieu was interested. Well, after all, the English must have seen some value in the place or they wouldn't have taken it. While the deal was being ironed out, in 1631 Latour was permitted and instructed to build a fort at the mouth of St. John's River, the terminal of an important trade route inland. He called it Fort St. Marie, although later becoming his home through necessity rather than inclination, it is forever known as Fort Latour. Around this time, his loyalty and skills were finally rewarded. He officially became 
the king's governor and lieutenant general in Acadia. This was a massive promotion for a nobody like La Tour, but what it wasn't was exclusive. After a treaty was signed in 1632, money changed hands and Acadia and New France became French again. The renewed interest in them meant more investment and Richelieu's investors did not trust some guy they've never heard of with their money. So, without revoking La Tour, a second governor was appointed and sent to Port Royal. Latour, of course, must have been less than ecstatic, but he and the new guy seemed to have got on well together and the arrangement worked. Until, in 1635, the new guy died. Enter the second man of our story, Charles de Menu Dolnay, better known as the Dastardly Dolnay. You'll see why, although in my view he and Latour were just as bad as each other. It was hate at first sight, and nobody knows how it started exactly, but if you don't know what it's about, it's usually about money and power. There has been the lucrative trading post that Latour the Elder surrendered to the English and Dolne took back, only to see it regranted to the old Latour. There were the overlapping areas of competence, which in fairness to him Dolnay did try to have separated in Paris, but the royal administration, as governments tend to do, royally messed it up. And there were the profits of the fair trade, in which they both shared. On his part, Latour must have seen Dolnay as an imposture, in it for the easy gain, while Latour has been there for years through thick and thin and worked hard for everything he had. The first blows fell in 1640. Latour came to Port Royal, Dolnay's base, to claim his share of the fair money. Dolnay told him to get lost. Latour asked him to step outside which Dolne must have done like a pair of kindergartners, I swear. Because next thing we know, Dolne was telling the teacher, sorry, the king, on La Tour, for having somewhat damaged Dolne. Bodily harm to a fellow officer and the mighty cardinal's cousin, this, that and the other, La Tour got suspended pending inquiry and Dolne was instructed to put La Tour's forts in some trustworthy hands. Well, none as trustworthy as my own, said Dolnay, and went to sack and loot Fort Saint Marie. Oh, you son of a dog, said Latour, and sent his lieutenant to Boston to trade for ships and mercenaries. Imagine the fodder for Dolnay's writing pursuits. The traitor dealing with the English against a fellow French governor after he failed to go to France to explain himself. Well, the summons that now came for La Tour from Paris were the real deal. He could not ignore them, but neither could he leave Acadia unattended. So he sent the wife. Enter the woman of her story. Françoise Marie Jacqueline, forever known as Madame de la Tour, which she would have never called herself because back then French women did not take their husbands' last names, fresh from France and 30 years younger than her husband, he scored in a major fashion, you might say. It is not known how the marriage was arranged. La Tour's first wife had by then died. Françoise Jacqueline signed her marriage contract on the last day of 1639 against the signature of La Tour's attorney and travelled to Acadia on her own the following year for the ceremony. So, she was a bit of daredevil. I mean, 30 years later, the next king of France had to pay women to go there. And also clever. A commoner unschooled in the ways of the court, she very much succeeded on her mission to Paris. With the whole situation explained in her husband's favor, she was coming back with the Admiral of France's own orders for ships, armaments and forts to be reissued to La Tour. It took her a while to get back, and when she did, it was only to find Dolnay blocking the mouth of the St. John's River and the access to Fort Saint-Marie. 
Latour managed to get out under the cover of darkness and they sailed on to Boston, where showing the French admiral's orders and mortgaging whatever property they still had left, Latour was able to obtain supplies that were now illegally denied to him by Dolnay. With a force of four ships manned by his own crews and some 30 English volunteers, he chased Dolnay to Port Royal, where he said he just wanted to talk, but Dolnay, taught by experience, refused to come outside. In the end, some cannon shots and one burned down Mel Leitre as the English volunteers weren't keen on starting an all-out war with France and refused to attack Port Royal. Latour went back home across the Bay of Fundy. And of course Dolnay was now able to completely discredit Latour before Richelieu and the King. That was summer 1643. Madame de la Tour went to Paris again and found the royal door firmly locked against her. Also, she found herself ordered to stay there and not go back, orders which she defied by escaping to England and chartering a vessel there. She was a resourceful woman. She returned to Acadia in summer 1644, just as Dolnay, having made his peace with the English, yes, yes, purchased a proper warship and ammunition and was getting ready to deal with the La Tours once and for all. Early the following year, 1645, La Tour once again traveled to Boston to canvas assistance, leaving his wife in charge of Fort St. Marie. Dolnay first attacked in February and she pushed him back. He had to withdraw with heavy losses, but the joy was short-lived. When he returned in April, Dolnay was deadly serious. Francoise Jacquelin once again ran up the red flag of defiance, but this time Dolnay was stronger and she only had 45 men. Early on the Easter Sunday, Dolnay's soldiers breached the palisade. The defenders were exhausted, many injured, low on ammunition and low on food. Francoise Jacquelin surrendered the fort on one condition. Everybody gets to walk away with their lives. Dolnay swore to it. He gave his word of honor. The gallows, of course, went up first thing. Francoise, tied up, had to watch her companions die, all but the one who agreed to act executionary. She died in captivity a few days later. How exactly is not known. Dolnay, therefore, was denied the chance to use her to blackmail Latour into final submission, but he didn't need it. Upon receiving the news, Charles Latour moved to Quebec and only returned to Acadia after Dolnay's death in 1650 in a canoe accident. Left alone in his last five years, Dolnay, historians say, was not a bad governor. Latour managed to rehabilitate himself in France and did get to govern Acadia on his own as well, although for only a very short period. Captured by the English in 1654, these were the English of Oliver Cromwell, so they did mean business. He lived out his last days in Cap de Sable, as in a strange twist of fate, the husband of Dolnay's widow and the stepfather to Dolnay's five children. And what of Acadia? Well, Dolnay and De La Tour lost it the crucial decade. The St. Lawrence colonies and New England took over and the Bay of Fundy was never to get a second chance. It was always New France B and to this day remains a bit of a backwater. Although in some respects that might actually be a good thing. So Fort Latour, newly reconstructed next to its original protected site, only opened last year. Go see it if you have a chance. It has this great story to tell. 
They taught us everything we needed to know about this new land. But not just about harvesting and hunting. No, they also taught us about the local delicacies. Gremlin on the road.